I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, I think this is going to be uh, going into our weird poetry series, the poem that we're doing today. It's it's pretty weird. It's weird, although like a lot of these, there's there's something kind of nice about what... What am I saying? Not like a lot of these. I think this is the only one I've done so far about <laughs> which I would say, hey, this is actually pretty nice. You know, that 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 poem about uh, Chairman Xi Jinping's backside was, was I, I think, uh, a sweet love poem. <laughs> you know, I have to say, in, in the in the most, much overlooked genre of butt-kissing poems, it's, it's a standout, I have to say. You know, the sycophancy genre doesn't get the attention it's, that it deserves. <laughs> <laughs> it really doesn't. It's much more nuanced than you would think. So the poem that we're doing today is just called Ji Mao. Uh, it's by a poet from the Song Dynasty. Uh, his name is uh, Mei Yao Chen. And Ji uh, Mao literally translates to something like offering a sacrifice to my cat. Uh Or for my cat on behalf of my cat. my cat. Yeah, it's really unclear. The, there's no preposition in Chinese there. So when you render it into English, it's kind of hard to figure out exactly the direction that things are going. But I, I just happened to run into this poem. Uh, I'm doing some translations uh, and I'm a big cat person. My wife's uh, yes. a huge cat person. I, I guess you could say, Rob, I'm a cat guy. Is that is that a you thing? You are a cat guy. She's definitely a cat, a cat guy, lady. So. Uh, For sure. So cat dude, although that that makes it hard to run the T and the D together. It doesn't flow very well. Cat dude, cat dude, cat dude, cat dude. I like it. <laughs> that could be your new. That could be your new name on the podcast. There we go. It could also be a a, a syndicated television show. Maybe oh, um, amazing. I would totally watch that. <laughs> you know, it was just a a poem that that I thought was really cool. Because of my 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 love of of felines, and so I, I wanted to translate. It was actually really really difficult to translate. I had to get a lot of help on Reddit, and there was still some debate about some of the lines. And and you know when we discuss the poem more thoroughly after I read my translation, maybe maybe we can talk about about some of that. But it just just Rob, is it okay if I just dive in and and go read for it. my translation? Do it. So, Mei Yao Chun, offering a sacrifice to my cat. Since I got my cat, Mr. Five White, mice did not attack my books. This morning, Mr. Five White died. I offered a sacrifice of fish and rice. I buried him in the river. I do it to pray for you, not to distance myself from you. Back in the day, you nibbled on a rat. Gnawing on it, you would meow and circle the yard. You wanted to frighten the other mice and to clear them out of my little poop hole house. When I was on a boat, we would stay together in a room. Although my rations were thin, at least I did not have to deal with having mice pissing in and eating my food. The fact is, you worked hard, harder than chickens and pigs. Lots of folks value animals that can pull a plow or drive a cart. They say that cats aren't as good as a horse or a mule. WTF? I don't want to talk about it anymore. Mr. Five White, I will cry for you. You see what I mean, everyone? It's a nice poem. Like I, I wouldn't if if you just gave me that cold with no background, I I don't think I would go, wow, that's an all time classic. But it's it's a very nice poem. It's I had to say this too, Lee. Before I even knew who wrote it, and by the way, everyone, Mei Yao Chen was a major poet. We'll talk about that in a second, I'm sure. But before I knew anything about it, I was I guessed it was written in the Song Dynasty. Because Why? Th- because if you've read a lot of Song Dynasty poetry, there's a lot of poetry that's a little like this. Uh I, I remember reading a poem, and I can't even remember who who it was anymore, basically cursing out the lice on an animal's back or something like what the frick guys get away from my animal. It, it reads like that because the song, <laughs> this is one of the reasons why honestly, and I, I, I hope this doesn't make me sound like a, like a nut job. I kind of prefer the song to the tongue, not in terms of necessarily like the, the sheer poetic quality, than the sort of wild Westness about it. The song is where everything just blows up and you go like, you want to write a poem about your cat, write a poem about your cat. Who cares? Go for it. The, 
the Tang Dynasty is famous for having these kind of blockbuster poets, Li Bai and Du Fu and Li Shangyin and and I hesitate to even say Wang Wei, but we'll we'll go ahead and include him in that. Um, yeah, why the, not? The Song Dynasty. It's maybe more subtle, I guess, and and it's it's not blockbusters. Uh, you have people writing about random things. I mean. We did a series before on uh, the 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 a pair of poems by Zhang Jie and Su Dongpo, or also known as Su Shi, uh, and and it was just about flowers, right? Uh, and, but there is a tradition in particularly China, uh, Song poetry, but it, it's really true throughout all Chinese poetry. When you're writing about an object like that, you're really writing about the poet's own subjective feelings like you're you're talking about uh flowers but really you're actually talking about the poet's emotion i think that this poem right here it's 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 very direct right rob it's 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 not a yeah. kind of there's there's not much metaphor it's just a very loving poem offered in sacrifice the poem itself is almost the sacrifice we see the fish and the rice being offered as sacrifices, but the poem itself functions as a sacrifice. So, so before I respond to the, the, the sacrifice thing, Lee, I wanted to to just share with the the reader, the listener, this that in, in David Hinton's book, uh, Classical Chinese Poetry, on in his section on Mei Yao Chun, Mei Yao Chun has another poem whose title David Hinton translates as follows: Xia Chihuo says the ancient masters never wrote a poem about lice, and why don't I write one? <laughs> <laughs> that's the title of the poem i love it anyway awesome no the poem the poem does work as a kind of sacrifice and it's interesting though to think this is this is how the how the shift has happened right i can't imagine a tang dynasty poet first of all feeling cool taking a something as sacred as a sacrifice to a dead family member or something and using it for their cat and two taking something as important as poetry and using it for that purpose, right? But that's the song. Can I correct you? Go for it. So I think that Lee Lee Bai would have probably, uh, I mean, he does definitely write death poetry in honor of some of his favorite brewers, but Lee Bai is an alcoholic, and so that sort of makes sense. But I I think I agree with the thrust of your argument that that the tongue just like is, is grander, but that the song finds beauty in a very uh, uh, kind of narrow vision. Well, and it allows well, it allows for more things to be considered beautiful. I mean, even the you know I don't know when this is going to air, but the when we did our dual podcast thing about Zhang Jie and Su Shi writing about willow catkins, and the point being that in classical Chinese poetry, it was already Han Yu already mentioned. You don't write about willow catkins. That's silly. No one writes about a poem about something like that. And so John Jian and Su Shi were like, oh, I think we're going to do that. Again, that's this is, classic because Han Yu yeah. is in the Tang. Han Yu, yeah. Han Yu is this this like major literary figure in the Tang, and there's something that he says, you can't write poetry about that. And then a songwriter goes and goes, wait a second, let me see if I can do that. <laughs> and it should, we should point out too, though, one of the reasons for that is the – the dominant style of poetry in the song, the tzu, is effectively song lyrics, or, or they a lot of them anyway take a, an existing melody, a song structure, and write a poem based on that. Right? It's, it could be used as lyrics for that song. Right? We sh- we should um, make it clear that Tang Dynasty poets do that too, but it's in a slightly the the genre of the shi, which is normally translated as poem, it, I guess puts less emphasis on that. The tzu, which right could be translated as lyric uh puts a bit more emphasis on that but but th- right. sorry to it, complicate your your explanation no, it, it, it is and it's, it's a good point to make although I, I again like you say i would say that in the song this is the style this is the dominant absolutely kind of writing and a lot of poems in the song the the title is just the name of the song it would be like it would be like if all of a sudden we started writing poems based on I don't know whatever the the popular thing of the day is. Let's, let's say so. A rap song, so right? so if and we I took a all poetry based off of the the rhythm of Jay Z's Big Pimpin, but it m- yeah. didn't necessarily have anything to do with either being big or pimpin. It was just oh wait a second, did we get our our musical reference in there? Yeah, 
<laughs> and if the title of your poem was Big Pimpin', and but the what followed had nothing to do with anything it was Jay-Z about, talked it about. It was about That's, it was about flowers. It was about flowers. Or or <laughs> let's let's go back to Mayo Chen, or about lice. You know, why not? But the reason I bring all that up though is because it helps explain why these topics suggest themselves. Because folk writing, folk these songs and folk story stuff, they already were down in the nitty gritty. Right? The people, quote unquote, we're already talking and writing about this stuff anyway. It was only the educated elite that weren't allowed to write about lice or cats or beer, right? Unless you were somebody like Levi, who was basically a wild man and could do whatever he wanted. And who was Um, not famous at the time, or who was not nearly as famous at the time, partially because he was so unconventional and nobody got along with him. And one of the reasons? Because he didn't write about the stuff he was supposed to write about. Right. But here's what's interesting to me about this cat poem. So on the surface, I mean, if... this is, by the way, one of the things I love about the best Chinese or classical Chinese poetry. You can just read this as an homage to a cat. And if you stop there and you say, I really like that poem, that's totally valid. No problem with that. But there are other things in here. For example, the cat is buried in the water. Now, in the river, rather, but which is made of water, of course. Uh, we do. Thanks know for a that. Bit Thanks for science. that clarification, yeah, no Rob. <laughs> I know you studied physics, but I thought I'd clue the rest of the the listenership in on the fact that rivers are made of water. We we aim for accuracy on the podcast. The cat being buried in the in the river or tossed into the river at any rate calls to mind some very very famous classical references. Right, some very famous poets were also drowned or buried in the water. Chu Yuan, for one. Possibly yep. the most famous, the writer of Songs of the South or Chu Tzu. Uh, Li Bai, at least according to legend, probably a, probably a legend, died in a river while reaching for the moon reflected in the water. Supposedly, right. I thought he was toasting the moon while drinking. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry, while completely wasted. Wasted, yes, and fell in the water. So there's a long tradition of very famous poets either drowning or falling in the water, right? So, so Rob, are you reading... The dead cat, Mr. Five White, as a metaphor for Mei Yao Chun himself? I'm not reading him as a metaphor for Mei Yao Chun, although I'll be curious to know what you do with that. I'm more reading it as if you were going to write a sacrifice poem, like you said earlier. This is this is the, the cat sacrifice. This is the sort of epitaph, right? What cooler thing could you do than to say, you know what? At least in my heart, my cat is right up there with Chu Yuan and Li Bai. I'm just going to say it. Let's go there. Certainly many of us cat lovers have felt that way. Yes. I think when when you, when your cat angel eventually dies, I'm pretty sure we're gonna dump her in the Willamette River and and, and leave sushi and sushi on the side. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I guarantee you're not the only person in Eugene to have done that. So that'll be fun. <laughs> but you may be the only one comparing your cat to I don't know, let's go with Sushir or somebody. Anyway. But that's a pretty cool gesture. So that's kind of what I'm going for is as sort of nitty gritty and write about anything as song poets were, they were still poets. They they knew their poetic references. This I don't think this was just a random toss off like, well, there was nowhere else to bury the cat. So eh, whatever, I'll just throw him in the river. Right. Maybe. I mean, it's it's plausible. Uh, certainly. Certainly in this context, I, I wasn't sure. And I, I may be reading too much of into this, but could we read Mr. Five White as a metaphor for the poet himself? I mean, traditionally, when poets in China complain about someone working hard and maybe being ignored, although it, Mr. Five White is not ignored, but he, he, he is described as working very hard, it's always a metaphor for the official uh, the bureaucrat serving the emperor. Do you see any of that here? It's kind of hard to because the specific tasks the cat is supposed to have done, I don't really see how, I'd be curious to see if you can if you can make this work. How that, like, that the cat worked hard, that's, that's yeah, and you're right, like a lot of poets have, or at least there's a tradition of metaphorizing the poet as a beleaguered worker of some kind. So that definitely makes sense. Like the line about lots of folks value animals that can pull a plow or drive a cart. They say that cats aren't as good as a horse or a mule. You can totally go there, right? The idea of the cat was useful because 
at least this poor poet didn't have to deal with mouse droppings in his food. Uh, like it's very, very specific about the kind of labor the cat did. So I'm a little having a little trouble connecting that with what Mei Yao Chen might have done. That's actually a good point uh, for for something else I wanted to segue to. That line specifically, uh, although my rations were thin, at least I didn't have to deal uh, with having mice pissing in and eating my food. In the discussions that I had with folks on Reddit, that was my most controversial part of this translation. And huh. I, I I am still uncomfortable with that translation. Other people translate it as something like at least at least you didn't have to eat leftovers. So hmm. I I th- I think that that's a kind of tough line to translate. So there is an English version of this poem that I discovered. It's in the anthology edited by Victor Mayer called the Columbia Anthology of Traditional Chinese Literature. It refers in that line to mice droppings or or mice urine. Uh, I forget exactly how Burton Watson does it. He does it slightly less colloquial than I did with the the term mice pissing. Um, But he, he still refers essentially to that. So I went with Burton Watson's translation. Uh, you know, anybody who is a who reads classical Chinese, we're going to put this poem up on the website, both the original and the translation. Feel free in the comment section to to leave us a message or send us an email. Do you like it? Do you not like that translation? Uh, specifically, that line. If you have any information on how, <laughs> like, did did Mei Yao Chun or a previous poet have a similar kind of 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 line like that? I would love to hear it. Uh, Rob, as we're wrapping this up, w- what did you take away from this poem? Not a lot, honestly. But <laughs> well, the some thing sushi is, though. That some sushi, yeah, yeah. Ideally, anyway. But not this is this is the other thing that's interesting though about a lot of the poetry from this era is that was it intended to be immortal? Um, if you're if you're already taking as your poetic framework an existing song, you know, it's big pimpin or whatever. And you threw some some poetry on the top of that. Are you really intending for it to be immortal, or are you just looking for a kind of a connection to be made? And in that sense, it's it's a really sweet poem. It's not one that I would expect to read from a quote unquote great Chinese poet. And it that ha- so that has its own its own charm and its own heft because it would be like reading T. S. Eliot with a very, very easy to read poem about how much he likes soda bread or something. Like, or oh. how much he likes cats, right? He has Or how much he likes poems. cats, why not? He has poems about cats. He has a lot of poems about cats. He wrote well, I mean, cats is based on his poems. Anyway. The musical, that is, not the the animal. <laughs> We're getting into a lot of science in this this podcast. Very remedial you know, the, science. The too, word poet know. is Greek. It's derived from the word to to create, from the verb to create. So you know, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be that surprising if T. S. Eliot literally created all cats in the world. <laughs> wow, that's an intense claim, man. I think you're going to have trouble with that one, but you know, maybe. But yeah, so what did you take away from it? I, I just felt like it was a lovely poem to this cat. Um, you know, you mentioned whether or not he's trying to to write for the ages to be immortal, but he he does sort of immortalize his cat. I mean, how many other 11th century cats do you know of we we know mr five white do do we know any others are there are there that many others that we know from the 11th century he's writing from so he was born we should have probably put this at the beginning of the podcast he was born in 1002 ad and he died in 1060 so mr five white lived sometime in in there how many other cats do you know from that period rob none Although, you know, I'm not a classical scholar. Perhaps there's a whole, like, ji mao ji or something, like, collection of sacrifice <laughs> to cat writings or something. If there's not, someone should. Which we ever... And, 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 so, and, you know, we have follow-up questions we could ask, like, Lao Shu's Cat Planet. Was Lao Shu right. thinking about Mr. Five White? Like, you know what? We're bringing this back. I don't recall this poem in that novel. You might have just missed it. But I, I, I think that... You know, the thing about poetry is that it it does immortalize the people it talks about if if the poem is really good. And, you know, here we are, you and I, Rob, you're on the other side of the Eurasian landmass from China. I'm on the other side of the Pacific. 
we're a millennium separated from Mei Yaochun, and yet we're still talking about his dead cat. I think that says quite a lot about the, the power of this poem. I would agree. We're still talking about Mr. Five White a millennium after he's dead. So in that sense, I think Mei Yaochun succeeded pretty grandly. And I think we succeeded pretty grandly in explicating this poem, Rob, if, if I can pat myself on the back here. It's a good translation. Uh, it was a good translation. Yeah, we'll put the translation up on the website along with the original. Uh, if you have any thoughts on it, please feel free to comment. Feel free to email us. Uh, and we, also feel free, make sure you leave us a review on your podcasting yes. platform of choice that helps bring attention to the podcast. We love contact. We love hearing from people. So Chin Lit Pod, that's Twitter, Chinese Lit Pod. Although we're not doing a lot on Instagram, but we'll look, if, if you send us something, we'll, we'll, we'll respond. And of course, email Chinese Literature Podcast at Gmail, Patreon, Chinese Literature Podcast. We are still taking beer money uh, submissions. So there you go. And we've had several people in, in recent weeks write to us and 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 uh let us know that they support us with beer money we really appreciate it we do we really do it's pretty incredible get having people who are into what we do enough to actually give us something for it it's pretty awesome yeah thank you again uh for for doing that and and rob thanks for just hanging out and and talking about mr five white wherever you are mr five white we wish you well a 21 gun salute maybe before we leave (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, well, yeah, we're not going to do the whole thing on the podcast. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. <laughs>